Hello, um, and a very, very warm welcome to the fourth episode of the Inside Track. Um, I'm Ashley Davies. I'm the EMEA Regional Lead for the AVID Learning Partner Program at AVID. Um, today, I am super thrilled to be joined by sound designer, supervising sound editor, and re recording mixer, Steve Fanagan. So, without further ado, um, Grab your cup of tea, grab some snacks, um, and then let's dive in. So we've got Steve here. Hello, Steve. Hey, Ashley. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank good. you for having me. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Um, looking forward to chatting. Absolutely. Thank you so much. First off, just thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're super, super busy, so um, it's very, very much appreciated. I'm sure everybody um, is very appreciative too, so... Should we dive in? <laughs> Let's do it. So um, I thought, you know, just to begin with, um, there may be some people on the line that, you know, they might not be quite aware of what the role entails of being a sound designer and a re-recording mixer. So do you want to just start by giving us a little sort of background on what that what that involves? Sure. This is always a really tricky question. It's a funny one because I think, um, so it's good, I think, for me to talk about it uh, in terms of analogies with other uh, film departments and and so I guess like the so I'll start by talking about sound designer and supervising sound editor and then I'll talk a little bit about the mixing job as well but um I think from the point of view of supervising sound editor and sound designer I mean it, the, the, the analogy I find useful that I am totally stealing from someone else that I heard <laughs> use it before was to think about it like production design or director photography or costume design or hair and makeup where Essentially, uh, when a director is making a film, they're trying to make all these small choices in terms of how the film looks, what to include in the frame, um, how someone's hair looks, how they're, what they wear, where they live, the settings for any of the scenes that they might be building and thinking about with the rest of the crew, all hopefully tell us something story-wise, help us to understand what the film is, what it's about, when it's set, who our main characters are, uh, maybe what their backgrounds are. You know, someone wearing a particular costume, uh, you know, someone's in a, in, in sort of, uh, has messy hair and, 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 and red clothing, it maybe tells us something about that character before they've even said anything to us when we see them on screen. So I suppose with sound design and with sound editing, we're trying to do something similar with sound. We're trying to figure out what the world of the film should sound like to best express the director's intention and to best support the story and the narrative. And I, you know, as the as the sound designer or the supervisor, you're the person who is probably from the sound department most in contact with the director on that. Um, and you are sort of hopefully having good conversations with them through the process to try to help them figure out how to use sound and what to do with sound that best expresses story, character. Um, and so like th that can be really simple stuff, like trying to figure out, you know, the geography of, of, of the world the film set in, and that could then dictate maybe, you know, whether we hear particular bird calls or whether we, you know, what the weather's like outside or, you yeah. know, if we're in a period of drama, obviously we're not going to hear cars, we're going to hear horse and cars or we're going to, you know, so there is all sorts of um, kind of decisions and ideas that in the early stages of the sound edit, we're trying to figure out that will help to inform the viewer uh, on a subconscious level about the world of the film. Mm. Um, and so, so that, like, that's the main job of the supervisor. And, and the sound designer, I suppose, but there's like a, a couple other things that are de definitely important in there as well. As a supervisor, you're generally working with a team of other of, of sound editors. So you're also trying to communicate with them, make sure that they have what they need in terms of, uh, of sounds, in terms of ideas, in terms of feedback, as they're working on their aspect of the job. Um, and, and that's probably you funneling notes that you're getting from your director and maybe their editor and maybe a creative producer is involved in the process. And, and then the other thing is like, you, you know, as a supervisor, you're also trying to manage time, trying to manage budget, trying to manage schedule, because all of these things have to happen um, according to 
whatever is available for that film. And so there's no point in sort of focusing all your work on 10 minutes of a, of a 90 minute film and doing those 10 minutes really well. You have to figure out how to use the resources that you have to best create a soundtrack with your director for the film that you're making with them um, that, that, that is achievable in the time and with the budget that you have. So there's a, there's a kind of a management aspect to it um, from that point of view, um, but it's it's a creative collaboration with the rest of your team. Um, and then I suppose the, the other aspect of sound design and that term, I suppose there, there's sort of two, two ways to think about the sound designer. One is that in the context of a feature film or a TV series, they're the person who was sort of tasked with trying to figure out in collaboration with the director, in attempting to interpret the director's vision or sonic vision for the piece, what sounds are appropriate, what sounds are useful, what sounds keep the feel and the, the expression of that world consistent and feel true to it. Um, and then the other version of sound design and the other role that a sound designer can have is creating sounds from scratch and yeah. um, maybe things that don't exist so the classic example is to think of someone like ben burt in star wars where yeah. you're sort of you know literally creating science for things that we do not have a version of in our reality um, and, and and so that that's so some sound designers that might be their only job on a film is to focus on creating those bespoke sounds that are unique to the world of the film yeah. and then making sure that they you know, are applied consistently, consistently across a film or a TV series. So, so that's sort of a, a rambling way of me answering what, <laughs> what that role involves or what those two roles involve, but they're kind of, they're quite broad. You know, a lot of a supervising sound editor's day can be spent talking to people and not just cutting sound. Um, and, and that can be communicating with your director, communicating with their editor, their producers, your post-production supervisor, the rest of the team. Um, and it can also be just about sitting in a dark room on your own and uh, making sounds for the film. So, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things that sort of fall under that banner and, uh, and they're all hugely important for the, if the work is going to be good and consistent and, and right. useful to the filmmakers you're working with. Right. And then I suppose the, the, the re-recording mixer part of the job is about taking all those sounds and all those ideas that have been worked on and thought about and developed in the sound editorial process and, and trying to figure out how to bring them all together along with the score mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to make the best, most creative, most honest version of the, the sound for the film that, that, the, that your director wants you to or has been pushing for. And that I suppose, you, you know, that, that feels like it belongs in that film and, and and if it were any other way it wouldn't feel natural or, or correct and i think you know even when you think about fantasy the you know films that have big explosions or big moments we're yeah. still looking for a certain reality and a certain naturalness to that sound we're still hoping that it's true to the world of the film no matter how sort of fantastical that might be and so the mixer sort of has that job or, or mixers have that job in that process of trying to funnel all those ideas into something that is consistent and true to the world of the film. And the two work very closely together, don't they? You know, if you're in a mixed theater and the sound designer will always sort of be present because, you know, they have, they have their vision, the director has their vision um, and the two, they all have to come together. Um, and particularly, I think, in, you know, in the final mix, um, that's when it all starts to really take shape. So it's, it's a real, real collaboration, right? Exactly. And I, th I think it's a really good point. Like, so the mix generally breaks down into a process of pre-mixing, which is often the sound team uh, and mixers may be working in isolation, but trying to refine the sounds to a point where they're ready to present to a director to get input into that last creative push on the sound for the film in the final mix. And I think often as a supervisor or as the sound designer on the stage, you're sort of the go-between between, between the director and the mixers. Um, because mixing can be quite, it's, they're very full on days. Um, and so, you know, and the mixer generally just wants to be facing forward, looking at the screen, mm -hmm. working through the tracks. 
and, and the director will be sat somewhere behind them. And, and somewhere either at the console or elsewhere in the theater will be the supervising sound editor and sound designer. And, and I think when the mixer is working, often it's your job to gauge how the director's feeling about it or to let the director know that it's still been worked on, you know? Oh. Yeah, I know those feet are too loud right now, but he's just working on that line of ADR. Or she's just working <laughs> on that line of ADR. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a... Um, in that collaborative, uh, in the spirit of that collaboration, there is a kind of a, um, there's a great role to be had there where you can create space and, and time for the mixer to work. Um, and you can be sort of thinking about and talking about the bigger ideas with your director and, and whoever else might be part of that creative process at the time. And then feeding the, the mixer with those notes as and when they are able to hear them and take them in. So mm -hmm. I think that collaboration is really important. And I think for me, if I'm also mixing on a job, which I do quite a bit of the time, I always make sure that I have someone on the stage with me who's a co-supervisor mm -hmm. so that that information can be filtered to me if I'm totally distracted by what I'm doing mix-wise. Um, if I'm, you know, if you're trying to just work on sitting the footsteps into the world or you're, you know, whatever it might be, sometimes it's hard to hear a note. So to have someone there to communicate that to you and to remember the things that come up each time you do a pass through a scene can be really important. So um, it's a hugely collaborative um, job. And I think like I always sort of, I should have actually prefaced this by saying, you know, when I, anything that I talk about today, I mean, it's very much the work of a team and anything that I've ever worked on, no matter what my job has been on it, I have been relying on the work of other people and, and the skills of other people to help us as a collective figure out what the film needs. And we're always doing that under the direction of our director, under their guidance. They're the one who knows the film better than anyone. Um, and so it's always a collaboration. You're always helping someone um, to hopefully realize what they're hoping to with their film. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the other key players that might be involved in that are their film editor um, mm -hmm. or editors. And, and then there's generally films tend to have a, a key creative producer or a key creative producers. So there can be, you know, on a mixed stage, there could be you know, two re-recording mixers, a couple of supervisors, maybe a couple of editors, sound editors, you might have the film's editor, the director and, and, and creative producers. So you could have, you know, all those voices in the room trying to figure out how to eke the best version of the sound for the film out at any moment. Mm. And could you just share with us um, a little bit about your typical workflow when you approach um, a new project? So with things like working with the director to make sure that you're aligned with their vision, building relationships with the production team, and you know, just a little bit about spotting sheets. Is it something that you use? Um, do you use markers on the timeline? Um, how do you look at it as as a whole, um, and is it ever overwhelming? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think there's probably nothing more overwhelming than day one on a job when you're <laughs> looking, looking at an empty timeline and you're sort of going, you know, this has worked out before, and I, I, you know, I've I've I've, I've a few credits to my name, and and it's worked out okay. But I think that first day, and generally as you approach a new piece of work, you're usually there is a nervousness and an anxiety to it that is not a bad thing for the creativity. I think if you felt like, I think if I felt like I knew what I was doing from the get-go, as in I thought, I know what this film is, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and it'll be great, then yeah. I would be missing an opportunity to probably do something that is right for the film. You know, it's easy to do something that's adequate. It's much harder to do something that's sort of... Um, tailored to and specific to the film that you're working on. And I suppose that's what you're always trying to work toward. It's sort of, and I, and I, I think it's, all, it's being open to that idea of um, as you work on things, um, your first idea might not be your best mm. or your first idea might be a brilliant, um, a brilliant pathway to the best idea for the scene. Um, and so for me, I, I like to, I like to work quickly and I like to do my first, pass quite quickly because it means that I can kind of get an overview of what I think I need to go and record or I can get an overview of things that I'm I think are going to be tricky I often start in what I think is going to be the hardest scene or sequence as my first thing because 
I feel like I, I owe it to my director to get them something quickly for it. So mm -hmm. I sort of say, okay, well, so, so to backtrack a little bit, you mentioned spotting. And so that process generally involves sitting down with the director and their editor and watching the film and stopping and starting and talking through scenes. And that process can take lots of different shapes depending on your relationship with the people that you're working with. So the first time you work with someone, it's gonna be different than if you work with them a second, a third, and fourth time. Mm -hmm. But it's generally about sort of, I like, I really like for those sessions to be about us talking about sound as a feeling or an emotion or as a story point rather than as I need a door there or we need to we need to do a car buyer you know all of that stuff will become obvious as we work through it but I think what's more interesting and more important is to talk about emotion and feeling and trying to get an understanding engage a, uh, an appreciation for what the world of the film is and then to figure out how best to use sound to express that if that makes sense mm. and so so you hopefully in in that conversation that you're having at the spotting session you're you're talking about those things you're mm. you'll hopefully have read a script in advance you may which i love to do is have had a chance to actually watch the cut beforehand so that mm. it's percolated a little bit and you're familiar with it um, and and you'll talk about all sorts of things you'll talk about parts of the sound maybe they're technically worried about whether you can hear the dialogue or whether it's intelligible or whether we'll need to re-record some lines in ADR or whatever that might be um, and, and we tend to talk about I suppose you, you try to talk about all the tiny details of what might be possible in the film and sometimes it's great to get a sense of what a director really doesn't like or really doesn't think is appropriate for the film that um that's happening uh, that, that for the world that they've created. It's often mm -hmm. really good to know the stuff that 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 they're just like, I want to avoid that. I don't want to do that thing. Yeah. Uh, let's try and find our version of 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 X trope. Let's not use that trope. And I, so that can be really helpful because you're sort of getting a sense of their taste. But then I think part of the journey then in the in the days and the weeks after that are sort of testing your understanding of that conversation you've had with them. Mm -hmm. So you know because sound is a very subjective thing and i think we we use language like we will say oh this scene should be warm or this should be cold or or this should you know and and those terms are very individual to each of us so i'm often i'm really interested to send a director something quickly or have them come in and listen to something with me quickly where i go and now we were talking about this being warm here's my take on that but but does this feel like your version of warm yeah <laughs> And by starting, what I find is, so there's two benefits that I find from it. One is if I'm going, look, I've done this really quick sketch. So don't get bogged down. And if you hate it, that's totally cool. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out my way into it. And I'm trying to make sure that I'm understanding you. And, and so they don't, you know, I, I haven't gone and squirreled away for several weeks. And I'm going, ta-da, this is brilliant, isn't it? I'm sort of going, what do you think of this? I'm trying to figure this out. Mm. Let's you know, and, and it'll help us find our way to a common language and a common sense of feeling about what we're working on. And so I find that really useful. Mm -hmm. And and I think those initial bits of feedback can really, you know, if you're way off on something or you're close to something, then at least you've got a kind of, you've ruled some stuff out, you've ruled some stuff in. So your next pass, you'll kind of have a better gauge of, of, of what they're looking for. Um, and, and also for me then, is a brilliant experience of listening to the work with someone else. You almost hear it entirely differently when someone is sitting in the room and you're presenting your yeah. work. And so it's great to do that early in the process because you know you you almost you can almost feel what someone's thinking as they watch it. And it's an amazing thing. I don't really know why that is or, or how to describe it or why suddenly you hear it differently, but it, it's an experience that lots of people talk about. So um, it's definitely common, I think, in this work. So I love to get to do that because it really helps me get a perspective. You know, often when you're working on a sequence, you're, you're really sort of looking at the minute detail and you're really bogged down in that. And so to be able to zoom out, have someone else's perspective and to sort of feel their perspective is really helpful, you know? Mm -hmm.
Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I think like in terms of marker, I love using markers. Um, a couple of my colleagues use a, a piece of software called Heavy Load, which will create a little scene track for them from the script. Mm-hmm. And that basically, so you have in your Pro Tools session, you'll have a scene track, which is like region groups. And each of them will, it'll be whatever the in the script, the scene heading was or the sequence heading was. So if, and I like to drop markers for that stuff because it helps me figure out where my boundaries are for if I'm cutting ambiences or I'm working on in and out points or time cuts. If I go through, and it also gives me an opportunity to go through the film quickly, just basically going, you know, these are the cuts, these are the time transitions. It gives me a chance to sort of start thinking about the sounds I want to collect and the sounds I, I feel I have or don't have for something or things I might need to make or create. So, um, so I find that process quite a meditative one and, and, a, and a really useful one to just sort of, again, I suppose what you're trying to do in the first week is you're, you're just trying to, find your way in with the film. So anything you can do to familiarize yourself with it, that doesn't just involve sitting and watching it because there's sort of a part of the process that has to be about doing stuff. You know, you can sit and watch something for it and have all the great ideas in the world, but until you start trying to ex- execute those ideas, you have no idea if you're going to be able to. So I really love to chip away at it and, and try to get under the skin of it a little bit. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you take it into the mix theater, you have a super, se- a super session and it's just a big long line of yellow. It's just all, <laughs> all markers. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you, you've seen my markers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you've experienced that. There are many. And, and uh, like, yes. I really, I, I love to drop them in for things. So I'll drop them in for really obvious stuff like scene changes or time cuts, but I also love to drop them in if I feel like, so say, sound is generally perspective or uh, subjective in a film. So there's usually a point of view where you're trying to figure out a point of view for a scene or a sequence or a moment. And often that's about your main character or characters. Oh. And so you're trying to figure out, well, if our main character is, is Angela, uh, what's Angela feeling at this moment? Because that will in some way tell us maybe what she's hearing or how she's hearing. And so you're looking for those clues as you watch through and drop your markers. And sometimes you see a blink or you see a head turn or you see someone drop their head or you see them smile, whatever it might be. And you kind of realize, actually, there's something in that physicality, in that body language that invites us from a sound point of view Mm. to do something subjective from their point of view. So, I, you know, on a really basic on a a really simple level, like talking about my own work, if, if you something like normal people, which uh, like on the surface might feel like uh, a, a doma- you know, like a domestic show set in modern day. And so the sounds are kind of real world. And, but there's lots of little ideas in there, lots of tiny details where you're mm-hmm. trying to figure out where the sound, where things would get really quiet or where things would play larger than life. And if you think the, the sequence where Colin and Marianne kiss for the first time, we, you know, the sound is this thing where it starts off quite normal, quite loud. You know, there's a world outside Marianne's house, but as we sort of draw into them in this moment of intimacy, their footsteps get a little bit closer, their breath becomes a little bit bigger, the cloth movement becomes a little larger than life. And I suppose hopefully what that communicates to the audience is that we're in this intimacy now, we're in this moment with them. Mm. The camera work, the way that show is shot is putting us right in the space with them. So that kind of gives us an invitation with sound to do something similar. And at the same time, as you're pulling focus on those small sounds, you're pulling away some of the bigger sounds, like so the world outside disappears or the Mm. sound of the clock in the hallway gets quieter. You know, and, and, and I think by making those subjective decisions all the time with sound as we work through an episode or through a film, we're, we're hopefully orientating the audience on a subconscious level. You know, you don't want to do those things and have the audience go, oh, everything got really quiet. You want to mm. do it over time so it's felt rather than, uh, you know, distracting. You know, it's mm-hmm. not something where, and I think that that's, for me, that's what I really love about sound design and, and mm. how subtle it can be. And it's sort of similar to how a director of photography makes a lens choice with the director or how an editor chooses a shot and when to cut it. There's a feel and there's a rhythm and there's, the, there's a sort of an idea of a, a point of view that you're trying to find in the work. And I think from a sound point of view, you're always 
led by all that work that everyone's already done on the film. Um, mm. Because it gives you clues and gives you ideas and gives you hints about how the sound can be treated to hopefully underscore the work that they've already done. Mm. Well, speaking of um, normal people, um, what would you say are sort of the main differences between working on a feature film and a TV series? Because you obviously you've, you've um, you know, to point out one, you've worked on Radioactive, which was a feature film, uh, but you've also done Normal People and um, series one of, of Game of Thrones. And, you know, what's, what's your perspective on the, on the differences between those two different project types? I think it's, it's really interesting. I think, like, the, you know, the, the main difference Difference, obviously, like the most obvious difference is just the volume of material. Mm -hmm. So normal people was six hours of television. Game of Thrones was ten hours of television. Uh, radioactive was an hour and fifty minutes. And so, and 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 generally, you get to spend more time on a film than you would on a TV series, depending on how it's scheduled. But but I suppose all of the same principles uh, apply. And you're trying to figure out how to uh, do all of the same things with your work. Sometimes you're doing it with less time in your schedule. So you're trying to figure out, like with Normal People, the director on Normal People and the main showrunner was Nanny Abramson, who's a film director that I've worked with a lot. And my colleague, co-supervisor, Nal Brady, who worked a lot with Lenny over the years mm. on film work. So this is our first time to work on a TV show together. And so you don't like we had this idea that we just didn't want to not work the way we're used to working or to do the level of detail we're used to doing on the films with him because yeah. we knew that we had a kind of you know it was the fifth time I had worked with Lenny and I feel like we have a way of working and and and, and it's something that we've enjoyed and it's meant that he's come back and worked with me again so you don't suddenly want to be rewriting the rules on that and saying oh we don't have time for that we, you know so you're trying to figure out a way to to be consistent with what you're doing. And um, I think like, uh, you know, the, the obvious thing with TV is that the story arc is bigger. It's mm. over a longer period of time. So you have more, maybe more things to figure out over six hours than you do over 90 minutes or two hours. But it's about, you know, the, you know, from a sound design and a, and a supervising sound editor point of view, that idea that I was talking about earlier of, trying to figure out what's appropriate for the show so that it's consistent so that you know there's not something happening in episode eight which makes no sense to the other episodes in the series you know it has to be something that's consistent so on both a film and a tv show the first thing that i do is i build a library of what i think we're going to need from an effects point of view and we we add to that the whole way through the show because we go recording or we find a cool library to buy or we you know we, that that's something that evolves and grows as we work on the show and sometimes like we were talking about earlier the first idea you have for something is only the stepping stone to a better idea for that mm -hmm. so you know that those ideas grow over time and, and and what's lovely about a tv show and something like, normal people was actually the first tv show i had worked on since game of thrones and i only worked on the first season of game of thrones so it was mm -hmm. like 10 years between the two and what <laughs> i had really done in between was feature work so yeah. it was really interesting to get back into that world we were working with a company that um wasn't wasn't looking for us to do the work as quickly as possible they were looking for us to do the work as well as possible so we got a little bit more time than a show like that might ordinarily get and that's that only ever happens if you have if you have your director driving that and you have the trust of your producers for that to happen so but i suppose you know there's just a lot more organization in a tv show over time there's a point in the process where you're just mixing back to back so mm -hmm. you, you have to have a team a really great team that you're relying on to keep feeding you material keep providing material you have to from my point of view i need to figure out a way that i'm going to listen to everyone's work before it gets to the stage um, and on episodic that's a little trickier to manage your time on because there is just that point in the process where you're mixing back to back and um, i don't like to ever go to the stage with material I haven't heard and played with in some way myself. Mm. And because I feel like I owe it to my director to know what's there, but also to kind of have felt out whether I think it should be there or not. Um, mm. and, and again, over my experience in a series, you know, you 
you you have this sort of memory of what you did in episodes one to three. So when you hit four, you want to make sure that whatever's going on is consistent with the world. But even if, like in the case of normal people, you move from rural Sligo to the city center in Dublin, there mm. still is a consistency that has to be in there. And so, so I think like I've really enjoyed working on both. Yeah. I've, I've I've worked on a couple of I've worked on several features in between, and now I'm on a on a TV series again. And so you just feel like you you know it's the same thing. I heard someone describe the work as a kind of you know when you're working on a film in sound, it's it's a marathon. So it's you know it, the it's a good analogy in that you don't want to sprint week one because. Yeah you've got to figure out how to make sure that you're using your energy so that in six months time, when you're at the last stages of it, you're still going to feel as excited and energetic about it as you did mm. in week one. Um, and so that, I think it's, you know, trying to be sensible about how you, you conduct your days uh, trying to, you know, from my point of view, it's always about hiring the right crew and mm. making sure they're people who I feel like I have a good uh sensibility match with you know you yeah. want to make sure that like it, it's like the same if you're gonna if you're gonna put a band together you you know if your band does a particular thing you want to make sure that the the bass player is in tune with that or the the drummer mm-hmm. that you're, you're you you know it's just just that idea there has to be a sort of an aesthetic and a sensibility and more importantly than anything i think a, a bunch of personalities that you feel you can collaborate with and rely on yeah. um so, so I think there, there's lots of differences in terms of like with a film, you're building towards one mix or maybe you're building towards a couple of temp mixes for previous screenings, mm-hmm. but ultimately toward one mix of this one block. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a TV show, you might have a couple of directors um, there's going to be periods of editorial and then mixing and editorial and then mixing. And so it's just a little bit of a different headspace. There's probably uh, more, more voices in a room on a, on a TV show as well, because there's always broadcasters and other people who have valuable input. So there's mm-hmm. lots of other people to communicate with in a really good way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's, so it, it's a slightly different headspace, but, I kind of, I can only really approach the work in one way, which is to sort of try to feel out what I think my director is looking for from us and to to hopefully work closely with them to help them find it and for us to figure it out. So, right. you know, it, yeah, they're, they're, they're different beasts in some ways, but, but it's funny, like you don't, you never approach the work on two films the same way. Even if you're working with the same director a second or third time, each piece of work is sort of its own thing, and and ultimately, it'll reveal itself to you in the process. And so I think it's it's important that you approach every job with an open mind. And and I think the only yeah. thing, yeah, exactly, because <laughs> once you start, I, I I really feel like if if you start assuming you you kind of have this one in the bag, you you're just not going to do your best work. And I yeah. think. That's what I'm interested in. And I, I love when I'm sort of uncertain about something or when I've, you know, when you're working on something, you're kind of not sure what it is. You're mm-hmm. not sure what it should be. It's up to you to go on that sort of exploratory journey, uh, listen to the notes that are that are that have been fed back to you and to to find what's appropriate and original and unique for this unique piece. You know, someone, someone has had a unique idea and they've written a script or they've adapted a script and then a director has taken that and and they've figured out their vision for it and they've shot it in a particular way and then it comes to the picture edit and they're figuring out what the film is in in another way then and so you we as sound practitioners just owe it to the filmmaking process and we owe it to our director to be open to that and to sort of you know there's no bad notes there's some notes that you mightn't understand there's some notes that you mightn't instinctively agree with but it's up to you to figure out how to process them and how to work okay. through them um, sometimes a note about a specific is actually not essentially about that thing sometimes mm-hmm. it can be about something 20 minutes earlier in the film that just mm-hmm. isn't making that make sense so and uh, you know, notes, 
notes can change right so one minute it's oh can we uh can we turn that down a little bit and then the next oh no put it back where it was put it back where it was <laughs> absolutely and I, th I think that that idea i think that's what that's a really good that's a really good example because i think what often happens is sometimes you have to show the director or show the person giving you the notes something in its opposite for them to go no actually i think where it was was right Mm -hmm. but I just wasn't sure. And now that I've seen that other version of it, I get it. I get it. Yeah. We're, you know, and I think that that's really important. And sometimes it can be like a little bit mind melting because you're under time pressure and you're, uh, you know, you're, you're in the throes of something and to suddenly go, well, okay, yeah, we can do that the opposite way. Uh, and, and then to have to go back, but it, it, I've never, I just don't ever resist that stuff because I think it's really valuable. Sometimes when you do that flip or you do that change, it's perfect. Yeah. And so, and sometimes, and, 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 and in that other example, if the one that you gave, where if it actually allows someone to see, no, actually the way we had it was great. That's yeah. really valuable, right? It so, is. Yeah, absolutely. It's, kind of, it's all part of the journey of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, should we get a little bit techy? Um, <laughs> um, can you tell us uh, what tools you rely on in order to do your best work? So things like, you know, do you use Pro Tools? Um, is there any plugins that you favor, hardware, microphones that you use when you're out and about recording? Yeah, loads of stuff. But, well, Pro Tools is a thing that I use, and I think it's probably important to say, and, and, and this is not because this is an average conversation. <laughs> um, it's just a, you know, this is what I would be saying on anything, is that Pro Tools is kind of the, the standard for this work. And I think, you know, it's it's something that I use every day and I never think about, <laughs> you know. I, <laughs> like riding a bike. Like, yeah, exactly. It's sort of like, you know, if you want to write, you got to learn how to use a pen uh, or you got to learn how to use a typewriter. And um, for film sound, Pro Tools is, a, is, is sort of, it's the most universal tool that I've seen used. It's um, an... an it's really important to think about this in terms of how films get made mm. and how soundtracks get made. And often, you know, there's a team of sound editors, so we all need to be on the same platform if our work is going to feed into each other. Uh, that needs to be the same platform as we're mixing in. Mm -hmm. um, we all use other software, but ultimately it comes back to Pro Tools at some point. Yeah. Um, and, and when we're recording Foley or we're recording ADR or we're you know getting delivery from music editor or composer pro tools is the thing that we all use that allows us all sync up and and so so it's just one of those things that um i see as essential it's not the first door that i learned i i was saying this to you the other day i i used cubase and i used uh cakewalk which like this is like going back to the 90s mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, uh, th those were th those were the first software that i ever used my like a uh, and, and I think that learning any DAW is valuable, mm -hmm. um, but having Pro Tools knowledge is really essential for the film sound work I've been involved in. Mm. And so, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact that there is a free version of Pro Tools. So if you're working in another DAW and, and you sort of have a preferred way of working, I would still encourage anyone watching to familiarize themselves with Pro Tools. And Pro Tools First is a good way to do that because it's mm. free. Um, and, and then to, to see how it, it suits you from there. But it is just about having the right tool for the type of work you want to do. Absolutely. And then, you know, my, my other absolute always open, always working uh, piece of software is SoundMiner. And, mm. and that's basically like a, a piece of database software that allows me scan my effects libraries so I can search them by search term, just like a Google search bar. So if I'm looking for a particular model of car at a particular speed, doing a particular move, I can hopefully find that by doing the right search. Mm -hmm. And SoundMiner will then allow me audition files, select the section that I want, and allow me to spot it into Pro Tools. So I find that, and it, and it has incredible sort of manipulation tools. I love its pitch shifting, but it has this whole new thing in it called Radium, which is sort of like a sync clavier but like in the modern era it's this really powerful sound manipulation tool oh wow yeah it's quite incredible it's one of those things you could lose many 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 days of your life <laughs> with it, but it, the results are phenomenal yeah um, 
there's a piece of software I love. There's there's a there's a, uh, an alternative called Basehead, and there's an alternative called Soundly. Uh, I know that Pro Sound Effects has their own version as well, um, which I can't think of the name of. But there's there are other examples. It's not the only one, but it's the one that I've used. I sort of started to use it about I don't know 13 or 14 years ago, and I haven't mm. stopped. Um, plugin wise, you know, it, 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 it always changes over time, but I have, I have my faves, you know, I love the fab filter stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I actually, I love the, the pro stuff and pro tools, like the pro limiter. I really like, I like the compressor. Um, but I'm, I'm a real, you know, for me, the most important tool that we have is our ability to listen. Yeah. I know it sounds really corny, you know, I, but, but, but actually I think it's really important not to get bogged down in gear. Mm. It's really important to respect gear. It's really important to have things that you like, things that you need, but you don't need to have all of the gear. Mm. Um, and, and all we have to do is look at film history uh, or look at music history to look for examples of how brilliant things were made very simply. Um, and they were made because people knew what they were doing and they were listening. So I think you know the most important thing is to to have an appetite to listen, to have an appetite to develop a taste and a flavor for sound. And um, and I think this is true of any sound discipline you might be involved in, whether it's music or radio or film or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. But just that idea that um that you're you're constantly listening, you're constantly trying to tune your ears into things. You mm-hmm. you're sort of out looking for sounds that you think are interesting. Um, you're trying to figure out how, you know, if you watch a film and you really like it, chances are the sound was good. So go back and watch it again, try to figure out what was good about the sound, figure out what they were doing. Um, and I think that that's invaluable. I, you know, and so I think that listening thing is really important. Um, when I go out and record, I have a few different recorders. The main one I use these days is just a, a USB, or sorry, a, a sound device is mixed pre th- pre three. Mm. Uh, the newer version of it but yeah. I, it's quite a small compact recorder which I quite like because mm. I generally am out recording real world sounds so I like to be as discreet as I can be um, you know I think anyone who's ever been out in a street with a microphone will have had the experience of people shouting into it or yes. <laughs> or like beeping their horn or whatever it might be yeah. it's sort of a they can be a little bit of a kind of a chaos magnet yeah so, so I actually, I went to this workshop years ago uh, by a wildlife recordist called Chris Watson, who mm. works a lot with the BBC wildlife team. So he's done a lot of your, a lot of the, the sound recording for the David Attenborough series over the years. And he swore by lav mics out in the field. So, um, so I use a couple of DPA 4060s. There's lots of, like, there's some cool companies that do you know, more affordable versions of, of them, but just like small labs. So they're omnidirectional, space them apart. His trick was just having a coat hanger. <laughs> you it onto the coat hanger and you can hang that onto something. So his example at the time was just hanging it on a, on the leaf of a tree because it's really light. Yeah. And then, you know, it's a really easy, compact thing to carry around. If you're sort of out in public, you can also just clip those mics onto yourself. Yeah. So it's quite, it's not obvious. So if you're like, you know, if you're out trying to record some traffic or a bus by or something, no one is, a, no one is sort of getting distracted by what you're doing and hence approaching you and getting in the way of you getting that sound. So I, I find that a really useful way to record. It keeps it quite discreet. Um, yeah. But there's all sorts of cool recorders, like affordable recorders, like, you know, all the, the Zoom line. Sony has all sorts of comp- Everyone has a version. And I think when I think about sort of starting out in this work, maybe 14 years ago, even then those options weren't really there at the quality that they're at now. So it's really exciting how, you know, there's, there's a great um, thing that's happening uh, all the time where people crowdsource libraries. So a bunch of different recorders in different places would go and try and record the same sound to build a library together and share it. And like those recordings come from all sorts of different recorders. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just actually about someone listening to make sure they put the mic in the right place. And so I'm I'm very unsnobby about that stuff. I sort mm. of I think the best recorder is the one you have. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. it's, it's the thing you're gonna get your best sounds with. So, <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, it's really, there's a, there's a sort of a, 
the way the technology works now, we have affordable options and all of these things mm. that we can and record really good stuff on. So yeah, again, yeah. listening is so important. You know, it's like, so, I, you know, when I go out and record, I don't set the recorder up and walk away. I'm always with it with the headphones to hear what I'm recording, to make sure the mic's in the right place, but also to, you know, if you're out and about trying to record an ambience, something really great can happen. And, mm. you, you know, like, I don't know, a bird flies overhead and you hear something you've never heard before. Mm. And the only way you're going to remember that, and the only way you're going to know where it is in your library is if you've been listening at the time. And it's really yeah. So, so I think that's really important. So, yeah, like I'm, I'm not a gear junkie, but I, I do have lots of stuff that I use, you know, every day. My monitoring is all Genelec, but mm -hmm. I built that up over time. And, mm. um, and I think hopefully as your career develops, each job allows you buy or replace equipment or upgrade equipment. So it's something that I'm always doing. It's mm. sort of similar to, I think everything about sound work is sort of a constant learning and a constant evolving. And so it's the same with equipment, you know, you just because you're using one set of tools on one film doesn't mean you should use them on the next. You know, you sort mm -hmm. of, I'm always trying to figure out what's, what's appropriate for the next project. So can I afford to you know, will I buy that this time? You know, you only have to buy Alfie Verb once, or you only have to buy, pro, you know, you have your subscription or whatever you have, and yeah. you sort of build on that over time. So, mm. uh, so I think it's important. But I think, you know, when I, the first recording machine device that I had was a four track tape machine, you know, mm -hmm. and it, you know, four faders, a couple of EQ pots, and a yeah. cassette tape. <laughs> so you know you can make something with that you know and some great yeah. records and yeah. many Beatles records were made on four tracks exactly. so you know, it's like you just use the tools you have make stuff as you know make something that resonates with you I think you're always I'm always trying to see if something if I feel something about what I'm working on if I can you know if I'm piecing something together does it affect me because if it doesn't affect me then how can I expect it to affect my director and for them to then present it to an audience and have it affect them so mm -hmm. it's it's always about expression rather than gear but it's good mm -hmm. to build up things over time and keep keep interested keep hungry uh, to find new things to work with um, yeah absolutely absolutely um can you just tell us a bit about what inspired you to work in the audio post-production industry you know can you give us some background on like how you got to where you are today um you're based in dublin right um yeah. and uh from from previous conversations we've had you mentioned that you were actually started out in the on the musical side um so if you could tell us a bit about that that would be a uh, really really useful yeah for sure so i think like i think one of the things that's really obvious probably to anyone is that there's no straight path into film work just like there's no straight path into music work. It's sort of when you work in the arts, you work in the creative industries, it's, there's no door you go and knock on and walk in and get a career. There's just, mm -hmm. it's always gonna, everyone's gonna have a slightly different journey. Uh, everyone's journey is gonna be slightly meandering. It's never, there's never just a straight line. And I think that's okay, you know, I, I, I feel like if I hadn't done all the stuff that I did before I started to do the film work, then, I probably wouldn't have been able to do the film work that I did. So mm. I kind of realized at some point in my teens that I really liked sound and I really liked music. Like, I mean, who doesn't like music? But I was really interested in the mechanics of music. I was really yeah. interested in how things were written and how things were produced and put together. And I think so, so you know, from starting playing in bands and then like in my mid teens, say, I sort of, you know, by by doing that, then how do we record this stuff? How do we demo this stuff? What do we do? You know, and this was this was before computers were able to do this stuff uh, easily. And so you know, so so the tape four track or whatever, you know, the first digital four track. I think I used some point in the late nineties, and then computers maybe came in the early 2000s or around 1990 something like that yeah. but so from from playing in bands and, and knowing musicians and recording some stuff and working on some stuff then people begin to go oh you you recorded and mixed that do you want to do my record and you sort of I guess fall into it's the wrong wrong word because I was interested in in that 
but you that's how the, the journey sort of begins with it and and at the same time I studied communications in Dublin City University which is kind of like a broad media course where you do some video stuff you do radio you do photography I really love photography and that's what I specialized in mm. but I, I I had a love for radio as well. but I had this great photography teacher who was this amazing artist Carl Grimes and he was really encouraging of both the sound and film work that I was interested in and myself and one of our classmates for our thesis ended up making short films and I did the music and so you know these little things sort of were pointing in the direction of where I finally ended up but it, mm. it, 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 it wasn't until uh, I was about 30 that I met a Foley artist called Quiva Doyle who's an Irish Foley artist who I've done the majority of my work with since. Um, and she had just come back from Canada where she had been working and training for years with a guy called Annie Malcolm. Um, and they were just after building the first Foley stage in Ireland in Ardmore Sound. And so I was like, what? you do what for a living? Like, you, <laughs> what? like I, I don't understand this. You walk people's footsteps? Like the footsteps I hear in a film, you, what, what is this? You know, so I just I was so fascinated by it. Like, and I saw her do a workshop and I saw her create sounds live against picture. And I just thought, this is insane. Like, this is so brilliant. I love this. Yeah. And like, even, even though I was sitting watching her make the sound, when it played back with the picture, I forgot about how she made it. And I just believed it was in the picture. Yeah. And so I kind of thought, this is amazing. I totally, this is like, you know, from my point of view with music, I had gotten more and more into experimental stuff and I'd gotten more and more into not songwriting, but sounds and the idea of just sort of meditative feeling, sort of ambient music. And mm -hmm. so seeing her work as a Foley artist and then going out and watching her work at the studio and getting a sense of that, Mm -hmm. and then meeting some mixers and designers and realizing hold on a minute there's this whole world where you can marry sound and picture the two things that I've always been interested in mm -hmm. but 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 also you're sort of collaborating all of the time which I was very interested in because with music I had sort of ended up naturally gravitating towards working with other people on their music mm. Um, and so, so there was kind of a, you know, there was just a confluence of things that came together in that moment. And I, I remember walking into the mixed theater at Ardmore Sound the first time and seeing this giant Harrison console that was set up for two mixers and cinema screen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this, the room is like, a, it's a big mix room there. It's sort of like proper cinema size. Mm -hmm. I just been like, oh my God, <laughs> this is actually a thing. This is like... <laughs> This is a job you can do and, and <laughs> you know and then just realizing actually you know what this is this is so sort of it pulls together all of the things i'm interested in i have to give this a shot so so like like i said i was 30 so it was sort of i had a career and i kind of went actually i'm going to try and do this so i sort of had to start at the bottom again and figure my way into it but I just saw yeah. something in it that felt like it was a natural fit and and I think I was at a point where I knew that if I took it seriously enough I, I could give it a decent stab and if it didn't work out well at least I knew I tried to do the thing that I thought I would be interested in mm -hmm. and so the, you know so this is a long-winded rambling answer but probably all my answers are um but I, I essentially ended up then with my first job in a film as a music editor Mm -hmm. which sort of perfectly led from the music work that I've been doing for years and the radio work I've been doing for years. And from that, then I became a dialogue assistant to a supervisor for a job. And on that job, she was kind enough to let me cut some dialogue. And so then just over time, through assisting people or becoming an effects editor for a sound designer, whatever it might have been, oh. just started to build up my experience. And, oh. you know, I was lucky enough that I worked with supervisors and mixers who gave me some pretty blunt and pretty constructive feedback. And sometimes that feedback was, this is great. Sometimes it was like, this is not right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think it, it you know, I, I, I owe them a lot for that honesty and I, for that kind of, that feedback so important to helping you refine your craft and develop your craft and refine your ear and figure it out, you know? So, 
So again, I, I feel very fortunate for the people I've met along the way. I mean, if Quiva hadn't opened that door for me and let me just come and sit with her while she worked and then let me assist her for for a few months, I, you know, I wouldn't have discovered this. And uh, and then the same is true of the supervisors I've worked with and the mixers I've worked with who were sort of just really who were patient and generous. And and uh, I think the thing is, the thing that I've always noticed with this business is that if someone gives you an opportunity, they will give you another one as long as they feel like you've learned something from that person mm -hmm. and that your ego didn't get in the way of the hard stuff uh, and that you didn't get carried away with the stuff you got praised for as well. You know, there kind of has to be a, there's a measure to it, I think. And you sort of, it's great when something works, brilliant, but then there's these 10 things that didn't work. So be mm -hmm. better at them. And I think that's sort of something that's sort of ongoing. I think for anyone who does this over a long period, you're always learning and developing. So, oh. so I think, and I think if I hadn't worked and collaborated with musicians or I hadn't worked at radio stations and collaborated with other people on shows, um, I wouldn't have learned some of that interpersonal stuff that's really important to the film work. Cause you know, like if you're, if you're sitting on a mixed stage, whatever your role is, um, there's going to be good points and bad points in a day to give someone notes or to, to express your opinion. Mm. And then how you express that opinion or how you offer that note is really, you know, it's a really important thing. And I think learning those skills of communication and collaboration are probably more valuable than anything. And I think we, we all learn those in all aspects of our life. You know, we, we learn mm -hmm. them from every job we work. We learn them from school or from university or college or whatever we're doing. We have to figure out how to communicate with each other in a constructive way. We have to figure out how to read a room. You know, there's, there's times where you might have something perfectly valid to say, yep. but it's just totally, <laughs> totally the wrong time for you to say it. You yeah. know? So pick the moment, you know, and what I often do with directors I work with, you get into a rhythm where you realize they're much happier to talk to me at nine in the morning or at three in the afternoon. But, but outside of that, I just leave them alone because they're in the edit or they're mm. working with the composer or whatever it might be. And you just, you know, you, you figure those things out over time. So mm. I think, so I think like it's kind of a long winded way of saying to anyone listening, whatever you're doing is going to be valid for this work. Um, because you, you know, you're trying to learn, you're trying to learn a craft that takes time. You never stop learning. Um, and, and part of that as well is figuring out how to interact with people and how to communicate with people. So, you know, and I think with sound and film, you're always working for someone. It's never just your work. Your work is involved in it, but mm. it's someone else's film. And so you have to have that, um, that, you have to have that wherewithal to understand that and you also mm. have to have that sort of desire to collaborate rather than just do the thing you think is cool or just do the thing you think is right it's like no no hold on a second here there's someone whose opinion is actually much more important than mine in the situation mm, yeah a big one that i learned was um you know is just customer service skills and and you know i you know i'd previously worked as a waitress and i, I didn't quite realize just how transferable those skills are and and how how they work in that that particular kind of environment and I think that's you know for any anybody listening um who's who maybe a student looking to get into the industry um and it, it, take those skills and 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 utilize them because you know when you're in a mixed stage it's <laughs> yeah as you say you need to to be able to read a room so that's really really important absolutely absolutely and I think yeah I think I mean there's nothing there's no difference it's all just it's all human interaction, right? And it's all trying to read someone and it's trying to see, so, you know, we all say things, but mm -hmm. what we mean when we say them is something <laughs> different, right? How we say them, how you read someone's body language, how you, there's just some some moments in life where you realize if I speak now, it's going to be bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stay quiet, yeah. but I'll pick my moment. You know, I, I, I'm not going to not say what I think because someone is is hiring me to have an opinion on stuff mm -hmm. but there's just sometimes it's a good it, there's a good opportunity to offer that opinion and sometimes it's not and I think mm -hmm. gauging that and being sensitive to that's really important and I think I think that's why in this industry it's so important to have people from all walks of life mm -hmm. because everyone's personal experience is what makes them a unique creative and what makes them a unique 
a collaborator and what makes them a unique communicator. Mm. And and that all of that, you know, the more the more ideas and the more differences in a room, the more unique the project you collaborate on and create is going to be. And so being open to that and 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 being excited about that feels really important to me. And I think, you know, there's also that thing of I think we all have to always remember that everyone involved in the process with us, whether that's whoever's on the stage with us, uh, no one is more important. You know, you may you may get to have you may get to voice your opinion more than someone else because of your job description. But actually, if you get a note from someone, it's really important to hear it and listen to it and think about it because mm. someone else's perspective could just be uh, a revelation that you need to make the work good. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm, just, I'm conscious of time, so <laughs> I'll go through a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll jump to, to uh, the Q&A from everybody who's listening. Um, do you have any overall advice for the next generation um, in getting into the industry, you know, and um, what are your, your hopes for our industry um, moving forward now that obviously we have to address the elephant in the room, we're post, well, hopefully now post pandemic, um, but you know, everybody's now adapting to this new way of working that's remote. Is that something you've seen? And do you hope that that continues or, or would you prefer it to go back to how we all, all were before? <laughs> I think, you know what, I think, I think that, um, I think there's been a brilliant opportunity in the remote collaboration that this moment has afforded us for all of the bad stuff that's happened and all of the terrible stuff that's happened. What it has done, I think, is accelerated an idea that lots of people have had, but has been difficult to implement, which is that we can work from home at times and we can collaborate adequately without yeah. being in the same room all the time. Like a lot of my job, I spend in a room on my own. Um, I might knock into the editor next door or I might have a phone call with someone or I might go visit the cutting room but mm -hmm. there's many many hours in my week where it's just me and my system uh, listening to and, and playing with sounds and so I don't think geographically that that needs to be anywhere specific a lot of the time I think there are very important moments where being in a room together and collaborating is essential um, but I think I definitely think there's something interesting that's happened that I hope um, will open up more opportunities for us all with the work. And I think uh, I'm, I'm really excited by that. I, I, I was saying to you in our prep call, the film I just finished, um, we were working with, I was actually living in London at the time, director was in Dublin, producers were in LA, mm. one of the producers was in Dublin, sound, the rest of the sound team was in Toronto, and we managed to collaborate and interact and, and communicate really well on that. And it was you know, it was a brilliant way to work. And I think it really stood to the film that we were able to work in that international way. And the film that I finished just before that, my director was in Australia and some of the sound team were in Australia. And mm -hmm. it didn't, because of this kind of technology, um, it didn't create a barrier. Um, and I think that that's really exciting. You know, it would be harder to imagine this 10 years ago mm. or even five years ago, but, with everyone or with with most people having a decent internet connection or you know and having a way to be able to do this type of call and there's lots of great software out there for playing sound and picture in sync across these sorts of calls um, so you know it's exciting to see how the possibility that that that, that presents for us and i'm i'm hoping that more of that kind of work will be open to me and open to all of us um, in terms of like anyone thinking about or starting a career in this, I think the most important thing is just to, you know, find find an opportunity, whatever it might be, whether it's, you know, starting out as a runner or assisting or someone just opening the door to you to allow you to sit in with them. Whatever opportunity is presented to you, I just encourage you to grab it with both hands. Take it as seriously as you would the dream job that you're working toward. Mm -hmm. And I think that your sort of enthusiasm for whatever it is that you're doing will is the thing that I think ultimately will lead to the next job and the next job and, and suddenly you'll have a career. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, it's like the only, if you're freelancing and you're, you're sort of doing the work in the way that I have, then I think that that is the only way, you know, every, 
so so if you get an opportunity and you take it take it seriously mm. don't mess around you know respect it respect the people you're working for deliver on what you've promised and 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 ask questions when you need help take the feedback or the criticism or whatever it might be as you go and then you will find that those people will want to work with you again mm. and that's ultimately you know because you you become you know you are your own calling card and, and, and you're as good as the, the, the previous work you've done. And so I think if you've done right by someone and you've kind of, you've communicated with them well, and you, whether that's a supervising sound editor or it's a director or whoever it is you're sort of is hiring you on a job, then more work will come from it. And I think, you know, that's, that's what I found to be the most valuable part of it. And then just to keep learning. And if you, if you want to do film sound, then watch loads of films. And re-watch them, you know, and re-watch them and listen to them and figure out why the sound is cool. You know, if you have a film that you really love, study it, like figure out what makes it tick. You know, don't be afraid of things like like media studies. Don't be afraid to learn how to, to do some film theory. All of that's so essential to the work that we do because you're constantly trying to interpret the visual. You're constantly trying to interpret the cut. And I think that any of that stuff will really stand to you. Uh, but I think loving it is really important. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't do this job just as a job, you know, like I don't yeah. think there's, there's other ways to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they probably demand less of you in some ways. <laughs> but I think if you love this then that, and you're into it and you're passionate about it and you feel like you want to develop as a creative doing this, then and, 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 and ultimately you feel like you are a collaborator. Um, mm. you're not a collaborator then you're probably better off to go make your own art and make it brilliant on your own and then figure out how to to um project that out into the world um, mm. but with this it's like it's got to be about that so mm. um so yeah and then i think if, if you know if anyone is you know there there are some great resources out there there's things like this which i think you know I, I learn a lot from watching talks and pod, listening to podcasts and there's, you know, there's so much more uh, available to us online than there ever was before. Like I remember when I first started this work, it was a couple of books and they were really hard to find and really expensive to buy. And, uh-huh. you know, th- those sorts of people that were interviewed in those books are now available online. So podcasts like Tone Benders or Soundworks Collection, sort of invaluable for interviews with brilliant sound practitioners. Um, uh-huh. There's lots of filmmaking podcasts like the Team Deacons podcast I particularly love. Um, I discovered the Directors Guild of America Directors Cup podcast recently, which is usually a director interviewing a director. Uh, and it, again, it just it just helps me understand filmmaking better and, and hopefully makes me a better collaborator. So I think there's lots of resources out there and depending what you're interested in, listening to a podcast on your commute or when you exercise or whatever it is you might do um, there's lots there's lots of great resources and lots of great inspiration out there and you've been very kind to provide us with some um, resources around diversity inclusion and equal opportunity within the industry as well so we will be posting those um, that Steve has shared with us do you want to just quickly um, briefly let us know what what they are and how how they can be useful I think like just to, to preface this the idea is basically that yes we have a diversity problem in the film industry and the best way to address that is to make the film industry more diverse and i think in sound it's really important that we um that we figure out how to bring more voices into the work and because the work will be better uh you know variety is the thing that you know makes things it just everyone is bringing their own personal experience to something so the more unique personal experiences that are coming to collaborate on a project the better the work's going to be so there's a brilliant thing called the uk post sound collective which is basically an online resource where you can and there's a bunch of sound professionals who are on there myself included and if you feel like you want to connect with someone and, and and have some sort of mentoring or just a conversation over zoom to help you figure out how to start your career, or how to develop your career, that's there for that. And um, there's Women Who Are Sound, which is a brilliant uh, uh, collective who are just basically promoting and 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 putting in all all in one place the the brilliant work of female sound practitioners around the world. Um, and then there's a in the UK. If you're in the UK, the union that we have there is Back To, and the Rough Assembly is the the post um, 
sort of community uh, for, for that union. And it's just great. They've done a great series of talks over the years. So there's lots of talks like these avid ones um, where you'll get some ideas for how to get your start. Um, mm. I think, you know, and there, there's, there's lots of others as well. I think it's just important to, to have some and to focus on um, making it obvious to people that this is not an impossible career. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's not a career that's only open to a certain type of person. Um, mm-hmm. If you're into this, there are ways to, 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 there are doors to knock on and there are doors that will open for you. And these are all examples of places to look for those opportunities. Well, they're fabulous resources. So thank you so much for um, providing those to us and we'll make sure that we post those out as well. Um, so let's jump to a little bit of Q&A. I can see some um, coming in here. Um, so we have a question from Glenn Kaufman. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, when, you, when you're tasked with editing, not mixing, do you cut for everything or do you make decisions about what things will be covered elsewhere, e.g. music, foley? Uh, and how many versions of sounds do you give the mixer to work with without overwhelming them with choices? It's a, good, it's a really good question, actually. So mm-hmm. I, I would generally... I'm, I, I don't cut everything because I think part of the idea, like there's a cool, there's a cool thing, sound editing. Editing, I always suggest choices, right? So the idea is that we are being tasked to make choices. And mm-hmm. I think that obviously the most important thing is that if you're going to make choices and you're going to decide, well, actually I'm not going, I don't think that's important. I think this is important. And you're, you're going to leave something out. You want to have had that conversation with your director. And yeah. I think if in doubt, cut the sound, mute it, make the choice in the track that it's there, but that you've decided that it's not the thing to, to present first time around. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, yeah, I, I, I love that idea of making choices. Um, I think you have to do it with the, the spotting session in mind and with your back and forth with your director in mind. But I think it's really important. From the, the point of view of the mixer, again, like if I'm delivering to a mix, I'm, I'm not delivering them more than one option on most things to be really Mm -hmm. honest um because i've hopefully in the editorial process teased that out with the director so that we know what the choice is and because i I think from mix mixer's point of view um if their work is going to be much more focused and much more valuable to the film as a whole if you Mm -hmm. if you've excluded things in advance so i think for me, it's really important to try to make as many of those decisions before you hit the mix stage. And, and the key to that for me is hopefully you get to start early on the project and hopefully you have time for multiple interactions and back and forth with your director. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, we have a question from Justin Randall. Um, you refer to film mixing as more of a live process than, mi- than music mixing, which adds pressure to the process. Any tips on how to manage requests that you might not agree with? A simple example might be director wants the music really loud for this scene, but you know the dialogue might get lost. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, well, that, and I mean, that, that's, a very common, that's a very common thing too, right? So I think, I, I think it's a really, you know, Ultimately, okay, so ultimately it's the director's film. And all that you can do is offer your professional advice. Mm-hmm. Sometimes to if you think that you're been asked to push the music too far, it's often worth doing it and then waiting for a review to see how everyone feels. Mm. And I think, you know, so you like at the moment you get the request, you can express your concern around dialogue. You can mix the music as best as you think you can are of the space for dialogue while still getting to the level that the director wants. You can look at the arrangement on the music and if you have stems, there may be some elements that you don't raise. Mm. Like to say like a French horn you don't want on dialogue because it's gonna be in that same frequency family. So trying to figure out creative ways to deal with the material so that you can get the energy of loud music without it getting in on the dialogue can be a really good thing. And I think if your director sees you working on that idea of like, well, how do I do these two things? Mm. And how do I make sure that the dialogue is okay? Because ultimately the golden rule is that if if the dialogue can't be heard, then the audience tunes out. Yeah. Uh, Because they're gonna be lost. They're gonna be like, I don't know what they're saying. So I'm missing (laughs) the story and now I'm frustrated. 
So, so I think so. So, in 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 the extreme scenario, you might mix the music louder than you think you should. You review it, and then hopefully everyone feels in the room like, oh shit, I'm kind of worried about that dialogue. Mm. So maybe if we went to you know if we went to 100, let's dial it back to 85. And I think that by collaborating with your director and working through it, voicing your concerns, but not like ultimately, if they decide for the music to be louder than the dialogue, that may be a decision that they choose to make. Um, mm -hmm. All that you can do is let them know your experience, let them know your feeling on it and give them options. Mm -hmm. And hopefully somewhere in that process, you arrive at a point where the music feels good, but the dialogue's protected. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another one from uh, Adrian Sandu on uh, LinkedIn. Um, when are you looking to hire a freelancer? Uh, when, sorry, not when are you? When you are looking to hire a freelancer? Um, as an example, dialogue editing, sound effects editing. What are the important points that you are looking for, especially if? especially if is an editor that you have haven't worked with before well i suppose like it, it's always you know someone's credits often tell you a lot about their work and and often when i'm looking to hire people i seek them out if i haven't worked with them before i might be seeking them out because i like something that they worked on mm -hmm. if you know if it's someone who the other thing that i'm looking for is a recommendation from another supervisor or a director or a mixer um, because they'll have a sense of the person but and then and then beyond that i think you're looking to have a conversation that feels like a good one uh, with mm -hmm. them and it's not like it's not it's not like a job interview it's just like a here's how i like to work how does that make you feel mm -hmm. how do you like to work Oh, cool. You know, I've never worked with anyone that I haven't learned from, um, irregardless of whether it's their first job or it's, you know, my hundred job or whatever it might be. And so mm -hmm. you're looking for someone that you feel you'll have a good rapport with and a good back and forth with. You're looking for someone that you feel isn't going to let you down in terms of the delivery on the work. Um, and, and you're looking for someone who I think a lot of the time with, with film work and with TV work, we have an idea of how the schedule is going to go and then that can change. Mm -hmm. And so you want someone that can adapt to that with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I don't mean by that, that they have to work more hours than they've been paid for or anything like that. I just <laughs> mean that if, if, if in a day to day, the request for what they, they should be doing changes because we need to get something to our director or whatever it might be, you're just hoping that there'll be someone who's adaptable and, and be able to sort of cope with that. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, some experience, it's really important. Hopefully, so you know, it, it's great when someone has credits you recognize because then it's easy to go look at their work and or maybe you've already seen it. But mm -hmm. but failing that, I think it's about really easy to get in touch with with another supervisor and say, hey, have you, I saw you work with this person. Give me your give me your honest opinion. Mm -hmm. So I think again, it sort of comes back to that idea of making sure that you take every job you do seriously, work with that supervisor or that director or producer you're working with in a way that's appropriate to the work and and then i think someone will not hesitate to hire you mm. on the basis of that absolutely it's, not, it's a tricky one that's a tricky one to answer but i think that's probably the best i can do no that's perfect absolutely perfect well listen steve thank you ever so much for for that was just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, and i'm sure there's a lot of takeaways there for um for everybody watching um so yeah, thank you ever so much for your time. It was lovely to see you again. <laughs> Likewise, an absolute pleasure and lovely to see you again. And thank you for having me. And I hope that I made some sense some of the time. Absolutely. Uh, aside from the rambling, but uh, yeah, thanks a million for the opportunity. And, and thank you to everyone who stuck around. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Steve.